Hi, my name is Chad Cook. I'm a natural resource educator with the University of Wisconsin Extension. This presentation is a basic overview of lakes, the various pieces and uh, parts that go into making lakes unique in our landscape. And hopefully this gives you a good overview that will be useful as you uh, hear and view some of the other presentations that will be part of this series. I'd like to break the presentation today into five different parts. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the physical, biological, and chemical structures of lakes. We'll talk a little bit about lake classification and how we organize and classify lakes according to those chemical, biological, and physical structures. And then wrap up with some information on human influences on lakes. And again, hopefully that information will lead into some further thinking from you as you hear some of the other presentations about how we uh, influence and uh, can greatly change the way lakes function. First, I need to start off with a little bit of a definition. Um, when we talk about fresh water and the study of fresh water systems, specifically lakes, it's called limnology. And essentially, this is the fresh water equivalent of oceanography. And in Wisconsin, we were very fortunate to have two of the very early pioneers in the study of limnology. Edward Burge and Chauncey Jude were both professors at UW-Madison. In fact, Edward Burge served as president of the university for a number of years uh, back in the early 1900s. Burge and Jude spent a lot of time in the late 1800s, early nine, excuse me, late 1800s, early 1900s, studying lakes, uh, pioneering techniques, uh, and essentially inventing some of the equipment that we still use today as we study lakes. For example, in this picture, you can see them in a boat with a contraption hanging over the side. You can see kind of a crane-like structure and, and kind of a box with a funnel-like structure hanging over the edge. Um, keep that in mind. We'll talk, I'll come back and talk a little bit about what that is and, and how it's used still today in examining lakes, especially the biological component of lakes. So we'll come back to that and uh, I'll let you know what that little contraption is. So let's start with the physical structure of lakes. And when we start with the physical structure of lakes, let's go way back and look at how lakes form. And in Wisconsin, our landscape is very, very much dominated um, or, or our character or features are there that are uh, the result of glaciers. Last glaciers receded out of Wisconsin around 10 to 15,000 years ago. Um, but the landscape reflects a very, very long period of glaciation. Um, in fact, glaciers were not static across the landscape. During the last glacial period, there were a number of periods where glaciers retreated and then would uh, re-advance across the landscape. And so each advance and retreat left a different landscape in place. So again, as the last glaciers receded around 10 to 15,000 years ago, um, they left the landscape that we see today. And on this map on the right, which shows the Ice Age deposits of Wisconsin, you can see very clearly the extent of the glacier's advancement during this la latest ice period. The kind of orangish colored um, deposit along or across the map, especially the one that kind of crosses the map from west to east, uh, not, the, not the kind of colored band up near Lake Superior, but the one a little bit further south. It crosses into central, north central Wisconsin and swoops down uh, through the central part of Wisconsin and makes a big kind of curve around uh, from Madison towards the Milwaukee area. That, was, that really indicates the extent of that last glacial period. That's where the glaciers uh, got to before they then began to recede. And as they were moving across the landscape, they left a large, essentially pile of the deposit, the moraines that are indicative of the extent. So as the glaciers receded, uh, they left uh, a very different landscape than what we see today, although it was the precursor of what we see today. And chunks of ice that would have broken off from the glacier as it was melting, uh, these massive chunks of ice were sometimes buried in the debris, uh, but as those that, that ice uh, melted, it left the, the pockmarked landscape, and many of those pockmarks uh, became lakes. But this isn't quite how Lake Winnebago formed. Lake Winnebago actually formed as, again, as the glacier was receding, it 
was a low spot in the landscape that as the glacier receded and melted, all of that massive amount of water uh, filled the landscape immediately in front of the glacier and created these, these very, very large glacial lakes. So this series of maps that depict what the landscape probably looked like from a period of around uh, 13,600 to 12,900 years ago show some of these different lake uh, extents. So 13,600 years ago or so, um, as the glacier was receding, there was there was this large lake left, um, and as the uh, that lake essentially drained, you can see on that first map, the the, the upper left hand map, um, there's a, a dot marked with Decora, and this is the outlet of that massive lake. And as the lake receded, um, the landscape changed and there were a number of other outlets to the lake. So, for example, uh, 300 years later, the Manitowoc, uh, marked as Manitowoc, was the, was the outlet of this massive lake. And as the glacier receded further, that outlet moved further up north. Uh, subsequently, the Neshota, Kiwani, and Anapi outlets. As the glacier receded, and this, these glaciers were massive amounts of ice, sometimes a mile or more thick, which is a great weight on the landscape. And so as the glaciers receded, the landscape actually rebounded from this massive weight and the elevations actually increased. And so as that elevation increased, um, different low spots would occur, which would result in, in these different uh, outlets, these massive lakes. So Lake Winnebago, and you can kind of see in the earlier a couple of maps, you can almost see the outline of what we now know as Lake Winnebago was part of this massive landscape. So uh, Lake Winnebago is really more of um, a remnant of one of these massive lakes that was in place as the glaciers melted. So let's talk a little bit more about the physical behavior of water. And many people know uh, the kind of the, the universal symbol for water is H2O. It means we have one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms combined together to form a molecule of water. And that arrangement is very important. Um, so as we look at this picture, this brightly colored picture with uh, colored dots on it, it really depicts the arrangement of these molecules of water in the different states of water. So water is very unique in that it exists as a solid, liquid, or gas in pretty natural conditions. So each of these colored dots represents a molecule of water. In the gas state, um, the, the, you know, thinking of a water vapor, the molecules are fairly widely spread apart. They have a lot of energy and they're moving around in relation to each other. As a gas is cooled down to the liquid form, the there is not as much energy in the water itself. So the molecules are a little bit closer together. They're still able to kind of freely move around each other, um, but they are more densely packed into any sort of volume. Cool down water even further and we get into the solid state where the molecules are closer together. However, they are more in a fixed position. They're not really moving as much as they would be in a liquid or gas phase because the energy is gone um, the, the temperature is colder, and so the, what we think of as ice is, you know, that, that those molecules are kind of fixed into place in that solid structure. So this graph is, is very important because it really explains a lot of what we see happening on our landscapes. And so let me take a couple of minutes and go over what we see here. So the graph on the bottom of the graph, you can see that it says temperature. So the temperature ranges on the left-hand side of the graph from 32 degrees, which is uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the, is the freezing point of water, all the way up to around 88 degrees on the right-hand side of the graph. The vertical axis, the up and down axis of this graph is the density of water. So this is really a measure, density is a measure of how heavy water is in any sort of given um, set volume. So if you took, and so typically density is measured in grams per cubic centimeter. But if we think about this a little bit differently in some more common units, think about a cup of water, one, you know, a measuring cup full of water. And really what we see is that the, the if you took a cup of water and weighed it, it would actually have a different weight depending on the temperature of the water. So, 
what this graph is showing is that suppose you have water at uh, hot water, 88 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it has a density, and as that water cools down, you can see the way that the, the line moves upward is that the density increases in water as it cools down. So a cup of water at 88 degrees has a certain weight. As that water is cooled down to 80, 72, 64 degrees, the weight will increase. It's not a very large increase. It's, it's a very, very slight difference in density, but it is enough that it would register, especially when we're looking at the scale of a gram, grams per cubic centimeter. So as the water cools down, it becomes more dense because those molecules of water are cooling down. They're kind of becoming closer and closer together. As a result, we have more molecules in that given volume, in the cup, in the cubic centimeter. So as water continues to cool, the density increases. But what happens, and what's extremely unique with water, is that the maximum density occurs at 4 degrees Celsius. So this is where water weighs the most. And what happens as water then cools from 4 degrees Celsius, or roughly around 39 degrees Fahrenheit, down, as it cools down to the uh, freezing point, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0 degrees Celsius, water actually becomes less dense again, meaning the actual weight of water in a cup of water at 32 degrees is going to be a little bit less than the weight of water at 39 degrees. And this is a result of the kind of odd shape of water molecules. As it, as it gets really, really close to the freezing point, those, those molecules actually end up being oriented in a, in a, in a way that uh, kind of increases the space between them. And they, when they lock into place, as it does in ice, um, it's got a little bit less density. So what does all this mean? Well, this means that ice floats. Ice is water down at the 32 or 0 degree Celsius temperature, and that water is less dense than water that's just a little bit warmer, 2, 3, 4 degrees Celsius, right around 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So the ice is a little bit less dense, which means it floats, which is why when lakes freeze in the winter, the ice forms on top, the ice sits on top rather than um, sinking to the bottom of lakes. So that's, that concept is very important as we look at what happens to lakes as we go throughout a year, as we go through the different seasons um, that are, are part of the world experiences. So if we take a look at a lake and kind of cut a lake uh, through the sides, we can, we're looking at a lake from the side, and we think about the fact that, all right, we're in winter, so we've got a layer of ice on top of the lake. And that ice is right at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you go down then, as you, as you go through the ice into the lake, the water very, very near that ice, so the water closest to the top of the lake is very close to that zero degrees Celsius um, temperature. And as you go down into, as you, if you took temperatures down through the lake, you would see that ice or the, the water would kind of uh, be very, very cold near the top, close to zero. But as you went down through the column of water, you would see that most of that water is right around that four degrees Celsius. So, and again, remember that at four degrees Celsius is when the, uh, the water is most dense. And so that, that water that's most dense is going to be below the water that is less dense, which is the water that is between four and zero degrees Celsius. So that's what, that's what we look at or what we see in winter. Now, as the lake, as we go into spring and the lake starts to warm up a little bit because we have warmer days, the sun's intensity gets a little bit higher. We know that the ice melts off of the lakes. And as the ice melts, the water that is very near the top, which again is generally between zero and four degrees Celsius, starts to warm up. And so as that water warms up towards four degrees, it becomes uniformly dense, uniform temperature throughout that entire water column. So most of the water then is about four degrees. And when all of the water is about the same density, right around four degrees, it's very easy to mix that water. So as we have wind events, um, we can see that it's very easy for that water to very, um, 
to, to mix from the top to the bottom of the lake. And what we call this is a spring turnover period. So it allows the water throughout the lake to be able to mix top to bottom. And we get a very, very uniform temperature throughout the lake. And all the things that are in the water are then very uniformly distributed throughout that water column. So as spring turns into summer and we get warmer temperatures still, and we have additional solar radiation, what happens is the top parts of the lake will start to warm up above four degrees Celsius. So it starts to warm up five to 10 to 15, 20 degrees or more. And if you remember back to the graph that I showed, that warmer water is less dense than that water that is around four degrees. And so what this means is that as the water near the surface warms up, it's less dense, it has less weight, and so it will stay towards the top. And the water that is most dense, the four degree water, will stay towards the bottom of the lake because it has just slightly higher density. It's not gonna be able to move up through that water column. And so we get this, this um, gradation of cold water near the bottom of the lake and the warmer water near the top. And we can attach labels to these different layers of water the layer towards the top is called the epilimnion. The layers near the bottom is called the hypolimnion. And there is a there is a, a layer kind of in the middle, which is called the metalimnion or thermocline, where we see water that it has a very dr rapid drop in temperature. And so you may have the epilimnion, epilimnion is fairly uniform in temperature, fairly warm throughout the entire layer. But all of a sudden, you'll get to the thermocline where you see a very sharp change in temperature as it drops down towards that four degree water. And then the hypolimnion is, again, a, a layer of water that's pretty uniform in temperature. And many of you, if you've been in lakes during the summer, you've experienced this thermocline. If you've been out um, in the water and you, you're swimming and you'll dive down and you may feel that you hit a, you know, that layer of really cold water below the surface. What we've done is you've kind of hit the thermocline, poked through the thermocline with your feet as you've been um, you know, in the water. Um, and you see, you kind of, you understand this phenomenon of having warmer water near the top, colder water down below. So as uh, summer turns into fall, um, days cool off, the, the thermal radiation is less intense, the water starts to cool down. And so as that upper layer of water starts to cool down, um, down from 20 degrees or more down to back towards that four degrees Celsius water, remember the density is going to start to increase. And so as water cools down towards four degrees, it becomes more and more dense. And eventually, all of the water in the lake will get down to that four degrees Celsius part uh, temperature where it is the maximum density, which again means that we have a water column that has a very uniform density, which allows it to uh, mix very thoroughly. And this is what we call a fall turnover event. And again, a little bit of wind, um, a little bit of mixing will allow the lake to mix top to bottom become very, very uniform in distribution in water temperatures and anything in that water. So this is kind of a, a snapshot of how lakes react throughout a year. Um, and what, this is a very important concept um, because it, it really does drive a lot of things that occur in lakes. And But I should also point out that this whole yearly stratification process really doesn't occur on Lake Winnebago for a couple of reasons. One, Lake Winnebago is a very, very large lake, large surface area, and it's a very, very shallow lake. The average depth is about 15 feet. The maximum depth is maybe 20, 21 feet. So because it's so large, because it's very shallow, it that that thermocline, the, the gradation between the colder water, the, you know, closer to four degree water, and the water that is warmer, it really doesn't allow it to happen. So because we have such a large surface area, shallow, um, shallow depth, the winds are very much able to mix the water top to bottom and keep that gradation from occurring. Lakes that, um, lakes that occur, that, that go through this process of having uh, these two turnover periods um, are very, very common. Some lakes will go through maybe one period where they turn over, 
some some uh, lakes will go, will kind of go through that turnover period many many times throughout the season. Uh, Lake Winnebago does on on occasion when we have hot temperatures and very low wind type of conditions, um, it may. A, a very, very weak thermocline may set up where the top portion of the water is definitely a little bit warmer than the, the, the water that's down um, further into the, uh, towards the bottom of the lake. But once you get a little bit of wind on Lake Winnebago, um, that water will mix up again. So it's a very important concept that occurs in lakes. But again, in Lake Winnebago, it's not something that actually happens very often. So the next concept where that's extremely important for lakes is the idea of, of each lake has a watershed. And really a watershed is just a, kind of if you look at the landscape and look at where water flows as it flows across a landscape, all the land that drains towards a river or a lake is part of its watershed. And watersheds can be very large, they can be very small. Um, and, you know, in fact, any type of water body that you can look at, whether it be a small pond, uh, a, a lake, a large lake, uh, a small river, a large river, they all have a watershed. And so those watersheds are kind of nested within each other. And watersheds are important because uh, a lot of the characteristics of lakes and what goes on in lakes is very much tied to what's going on um, in the characteristics of its watershed. So if we look at watersheds from a very, very large scale, um, we can see that um, we can take the, nor the northern uh, North America and break it up into a number of very, very, very large watersheds. So, for example, the red line you see running kind of from Alaska down through the western U.S. into Mexico. This is the continental divide, which really breaks the, the continent into the Pacific Ocean uh, watershed. So anything to the left or to the west of that red line is going to flow into the Pacific Ocean. Anything to the right or to the east is going to flow into the Atlantic Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, uh, any of those other water bodies to the east. You can and you can see that um, this this kind of pinkish purplish line um, that that bisects across Wisconsin um, gives us kind of a unique uh, situation that is not found in a lot of other states. Is that we kind of straddle a watershed line between. Um, to the left or below that, that pinkish line is the land that drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And to the right of that pinkish line is the water that drains through the Great Lakes, through the St. Lawrence Seaway, out into the Atlantic Ocean. Zooming in a little bit closer to, towards home, we can see that the watersheds for the Great Lakes are outlined here or colored here in this green color. So any of the land area that's in that green color is draining towards the Great Lakes. So you can see a good part of northeast Wisconsin um, is draining into Lake Michigan. So we are part of the Lake uh, Michigan, the Great Lakes watershed. Zooming in a little bit closer to Lake Michigan, we can see all of the various smaller subwatersheds that drain into Lake Michigan. And so, for example, you can see that the wolf, um, kind of the, uh, I'm not quite sure what that color is, that, that kind of light blue purplish color in the Wolf watershed, that watershed is really all of the land that drains into the Wolf River. And the Wolf River is part of the Lake Michigan watershed. And you can just kind of, by glancing over this picture, you can see that the Wolf is one of the very large watersheds that drain into and contribute to, uh, to Lake Michigan. Let's zoom in a little bit closer then to Lake Winnebago. And what this map depicts is the land that immediately drains right into Lake Winnebago. Um, all of the kind of bluish lines that are kind of across the landscape indicate the rivers. And those rivers and streams are flowing into Lake Winnebago. And, and, I, and I can point out again that each of these smaller uh, rivers or streams has its own watershed. Um, but then they are part of this larger watershed that drains into Lake Winnebago. But this is not all of the water that drains into Lake Winnebago. There are other large watersheds that actually drain into Lake Winnebago as well. One of them is the Upper Fox watershed. So this is all of the land that drains into the Upper Fox River as it flows more or less from southwest to northeast across Wisconsin and ultimately ending up um, 
the Fox River enters. Uh, the, the larger lake that you see in the upper right-hand corner of this watershed is Lake Butamore, and that will then drain uh, through the city of Oshkosh, through the Fox River, into Lake Winnebago. The other big part of this watershed is the Wolf River watershed. So the Wolf River, all of, and all of the land that drains into the Wolf River, um, is flowing south, or excuse me, north to south, and the Wolf River flows into Lakes Poygan and Winnick County, flows uh, through the narrows at Winnick County into Lake Butamore, meets up with the Fox River, and then flows into Lake Winnebago. So this is also part of the Lake Winnebago watershed. Putting all three of these big watersheds together, this is the entire watershed that drains into Lake Winnebago. And this is a very, very large area. This is about 12% of the land area of the state of Wisconsin is flowing into Lake Winnebago, uh, 6,000 square miles of land. And so it, it's a it's a very large watershed. And again, it's important to remember that what happens on in that watershed is very important because it will influence what's happening within, in our example, in our um, focus in, in Lake Winnebago. So let's now look at the biological structures of lakes and how lakes uh, function with all of the, the various organisms that are within um, the lake itself. So we can break um, the lake into different types of biological zones. And there are three pretty important zones that we could break things into based on um, what's happening biologically. Uh, perhaps the most important zone the most diverse zone is called the littoral zone. This is the zone that we often see it's, it's close to the edge of lakes and really it's defined by, um, by the ability of light, sunlight, to penetrate through the water and the extent to which that light can get to the bottom of a lake. So it's the littoral zone is that area of the lake where light can penetrate to the bottom of the lake. And if light can penetrate to the bottom of the lake, that then would allow plants to grow uh, because plants need that sunlight. And so if plants are rooting in the bottom of the lake, they're going to need sunlight. And so they need sunlight to penetrate to that depth. So the littoral zone is extremely important because that's where our, um, our plant growth occurs. And that plant growth is very important for fish and the insects that fish are feeding on. Um, and this is also the part of the lake that is really grading from you know, the, the, the water, the lake itself, into the shoreland and into the upland area. And so it's very important because a lot of organisms, a lot of animals and critters that are we find in our land are also very dependent on, on these lakeshore areas because it's, again, a place for them to find food and for them to get water and to find the things that they need to leave. So the, the, the littoral zone is very important. It's very busy. Um, and it's also the, the part of the lake that's closest to us as we live on the shores of lakes. The next zone is if you look at kind of the rest of the lake. So the, the lake that light is not penetrating to the bottom is called the limnetic zone. So this is kind of the open water area of the lakes. But again, this is where light is not penetrating towards the bottom. And in this zone, we see a lot of areas where we have free floating plankton, algae, um, small floating what we call zooplankton or you know, small animals are, are, are living um, and so it's really the the other part of the lake and it's important to really kind of think about this in fact that as as light as the the um, the cloudiness of the water changes from from week to week and throughout the seasons that line between the littoral zone and the lymatic zone actually moves so earlier in the spring for example if the water is clear the light can penetrate further into the lake. And so that the, the, the littoral zone may be much bigger. And as uh, we get later into the season, into the summer, we get algae blooms and other types of things that are clouding the water. The light may not be able to penetrate as far. And so that littoral zone may shrink a little bit. So the, this is not, this is a very dynamic system in terms of where these different zones are occurring. The third zone that's important is the benthic zone, which is essentially the bottom of the lake. Um, and again, it's very important, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what occurs in the benthic zone, but again, it's, it's kind of the bottom area of the lake that houses a lot of the, the decomposition and breakdown processes. If we look at the different, um, you know, players in a food web in a lake, we, we see that there's a number of what we call producers. Um, 
which are the essentially the the plants and the algae that are occurring in the lake and really if you look at a food web this is all about the transfer of energy and energy begins with the sun so as the energy from the sun is 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 being um, directed into a lake the producers through the use of chlorophyll are, are basically our plants are taking the energy from the sun converted it into the, the substances that they need to live and to grow. And then the consumers, because they are not able to directly take the energy from the sun, they need to eat things um, to get their energy and to, to sustain them. So the cons there are consumers that are eating the producers. Um, so there are things that are eating the plants, eating the algae. And then there are other consumers that are eating um, you know, big fish, eating smaller fish. So what's happening, though, is that ultimately this is a transfer of energy. So a transfer of energy from the producers all the way up through the food web, through the food chains to the upper levels of the, um, of the complex food chain that is here. So let's take a look at the producers. And again, in our lakes, the producers are the aquatic plants that occur throughout lakes. They're again taking in the energy from the sun and through, through the use of chlorophyll, um, processing and converting the, that energy into useful substances that they use to grow and survive. A lot of plants are growing, a lot of different types of plants are growing in lakes. The other uh, primary producer, or producer that occurs in lakes is algae. Algae are very, very small, um, more or less free floating plants that have the ability to kind of float around throughout the lake. They're not rooted in place like the plants are but they are also competing for that energy that's coming into the system um, and are able to, to produce um, and reproduce themselves into very, very large numbers. Algae are very unique in that way that they, when they have conditions that are, that are right for growth, they respond very well and very quickly and reproduce very quickly to create these large amounts of algae. And when you, often, when you hear or think of algae blooms, this is what's happening is the algae are growing, they're able to reproduce very quickly and their numbers expand exponentially. And what happens is what we see in our lakes is that the, the water turns green um, and things are, uh, you know, they look like they do in this picture. So if we take a look at algae in a very close up manner, so the, all of these are pictures of algae in a, um, very magnified state. You can see that the, the very small nature of algae, are, once you get to see them at a very large magnification, there's a tremendous diversity in the size and the shape and the just really unique character of these different types of cells. There's a very, very large number of species of algae broken into different groups. Um, some of the different groups that you may have heard of, we, we call our green algae um, or blue-green algae, are two different groups. The different types of algae have different um, characteristics or um, needs, and these needs will drive when um, the algae find their optimal conditions. So one class of algae are diatoms, and diatoms are able to um, reproduce and grow well early in the season. And so looking at this graph of kind of the abundance of, of different classes of algae, you can see that Often early in the spring, uh, April into May, there may be large uh, populations of diatoms present. And as the lakes warm up um, into May and June, the diatoms may die off and be replaced by larger populations of green algae. And as we get later into the summer, the blue-green algae are important. And then towards, uh, towards fall, as the lakes are getting cool again, we may see another uh, surge in abundance of diatoms. So the producers are doing their thing and using converting energy from the sun into, into um, their growth. And then there's a class of organisms that are consuming those, um, those producers, the algae and feeding on plants. And the kind of the first level of, produ or of consumers are what we call zooplankton. These are, are very, very small, um, critters that are, um, you can see them with the naked eye, but a lot of these pictures that you're seeing are, again, magnified pictures of the different types of critters that are floating freely 
within the water. They can move around, um, you know, and move themselves around, but they are very much at the mercy of, of where um, currents and, and wind and, and water movement is taking them. But again, they are eating the algae. They have specialized um, features that allow them to kind of uh, filter and bring the algae into their system, and they're able to take it in and use the algae as a food source. This is how we, we kind of collect and measure the zooplankton component of a lake. And this is, the, this is kind of the modern day equivalent to the picture I showed earlier of Burge and Jude um, as they were in their boat with one of their inventions. It's essentially what we call a zooplankton net. And how this works is that this, um, you can see the kind of a white material. And that white material is a very, very fine mesh. And what it does is it allows water to you know, seep out and anything in the water is kept in place. And it essentially funnels down into the bottom of that net. And at the very bottom of that net is, is a cup um, that's used to collect whatever is in the water. The, fill, the water strains out and whatever was left in the water is kind of collected in that cup. So this net, essentially it's kind of a round, uh, round opening on the top, attached to a rope is lowered down to the bottom of a lake and then is pulled straight up through the water column. And so anything within that water column is trapped within that net, trapped into that bottom uh, cup. And if you then take that cup, and because it's now been concentrated, it may have the zooplankton that milk, you know, in a, as it's concentrated, may look something like this. And so these are all uh, very, very small uh, zooplankton that have been captured. And you can see how um, it's, it's so much easier to see them now. And if you put these under the microscope, they would look much like some of the things that I showed earlier a couple of slides back. So the other components of our consumer part of the food web in a lake are the, are the fish. So here you can see small fish, and the small fish may be eating a lot of those zooplankton. The small fish may be eating some of the insects that are living in the water. These small fish are food to some of the bigger fish that are found in lakes. And these, you know, these fish may be food for some of our larger fish. Um, you can see this walleye, you can see in the mouth, there are very sharp teeth. And so this fish is, you know, adept and uh, well suited to uh, going after some of the fish, uh, the smaller fish that are its food source. And so again, it's kind of moving the energy that from the sun that is coming into the system and being used as a fuel for our producers is moving up through the food chain um, to the larger and larger fish. And of course, in the Lake Winnebago system, uh, the largest fish and, and probably the most unique fish we have is the lake sturgeon. What's interesting about the lake sturgeon is that these are really not eating other fish. Um, you'd think by the size that they are very capable of eating fish, but the lake sturgeon are really focused more on um, eating insects and other types of organisms that are very, very small um, through, you know, kind of their coursing through the bottom of a lake. And so they, um, while they're very, very large, they're actually not really eating some of the other fish. They're eating more so, some of the things that are lower on the food chain. So the other very important piece to this whole food web is the decomposers. And so these are the bacteria, the fungi, and other microorganisms that are breaking down um, organic matter or, you know, as fish and plants die and, and maybe sink to the bottom of a lake, they're being broken down by bacteria and fungus. And what that does is it takes the nutrients that have been stored within that organism and they recycle it back into the water. And these, um, these decomposers are found throughout a lake, but they're concentrated in the hypolimnion, which is again, the kind of the bottom um, area of the lake. And again, that's because, you know, the, the fish and plants as they die are kind of, they, they fall to the bottom of the lake. And so that's where the food sources for these decomposers, and so that's where their populations occur. If we have a large volume of organic matter in a lake, uh, for example, a lot of plants um, or algae that are dying and sinking to the bottom, fish that are dying and sinking to the bottom, um, the bacteria and the decomposers, as they go through their processes to break things down, they're consuming oxygen in that process. And so if we have a lot of decomposition going on in a lake, a lot of the, the um, oxygen can be used um, and you can actually see uh, oxygen levels depleted in some of the lower portions of the lake because of all of this decomposition going on. 
So let's move quickly into the chemical structure. And uh, the chemical structures of a lake, I'm not going to go into great detail, um, but it's there are some very important cycles that occur within lakes. Um, and really the chemical composition of a lake is, is very much influenced by the location of that lake. You may have heard of hard water or soft water. Some of us, if we have um, wells that we're pulling our drinking water from, um, that if that if we have hard water, we may use a water softener. And really, what that refers to is that um, hard water lakes have high concentrations of calcium and magnesium. So these two um, components are dissolved into the water, and what that does is it creates a hard water system and and so for us in our homes, um, we remove that calcium and magnesium through water softener uh, to make the water softer. Um, and so those, that calcium and magnesium is not um, forming deposits on our, our, on our pipes and on our sinks and things like that. But what it does in a lake is if you have high levels of calcium and magnesium, and it means the lake has a high capacity to buffer some types of pollution. The calcium and magnesium can, be, can attach itself to different types of pollution and so that type of pollution is not going to, um, to affect the lake as much uh, as perhaps a lake that is a softwater lake, which has low concentrations of calcium and magnesium. So it thus, therefore, has a lower ability to buffer against especially acidification. And again, I'm not going to go into much detail, but I will say that you know, chemical concentrations and the various concentrations and levels of different types of chemical constituents really affect the lake's ability to maintain different nutrient levels, which is important. So if we look at Lake Winnebago and kind of where it sits, and if, if we took the, the state of Wisconsin and kind of stripped off all of the soil that's above the, um, the bedrock that underlays the state, you'll see different types of bedrock are prevalent in different parts of the state. So Lake Winnebago is really um, sits on top of a, um, a dolomite and limestone type of rock structure. And dolomite and limestone are very high in calcium and magnesium. So therefore, the water that's running across the landscape around Lake, lake Winnebago is picking up calcium and magnesium and bringing it into the lake and making Lake Winnebago a fairly hard water lake. You can see that a lot of, if you think back to the, 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 the watershed that feeds into Lake Winnebago, so the Upper Fox and Wolf River watersheds, you'll see that a, a portion of the Upper Fox watershed is a uh, sandstone and some, especially as you get further north into the, the Wolf River watershed, um, there is the, the, the geology has a lot of granite and granite type rocks that are contributing different types of chemicals as well. So moving on to lake classification, this is again how we classify lakes and one way that we classify lakes is how productive they mean they are. And we use we often use the term trophic state. And trophic is really means a nutrition or growth or you know, how productive a lake is and how much um, how much life it's it's maintaining or supporting. And uh, there is a large continuum from lakes that have a very low nutrition or low growth to lakes that have uh, a very high growth and are very nutritious in terms of having the, the components there for plants and animals to grow. The trophic state can be affected by the age of a lake, how old the lake is, um, the shape of the lake, the, the size of the watershed that feeds it, the geology, which I just talked about, the flushing rate or how quickly um, the water in a lake is being moved out um, uh, and being replaced by new water coming in from the rivers, and human impacts. So the three kind of main ways that we measure, um, measure the productivity in a lake and we look at how clear the water is, how much chlorophyll is in the water. And again, remember that chlorophyll is an important component of algae and plants because it allows them to convert that energy from the sun into the, the uh, substances they need to grow. And how much phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of our key uh, nutrients. And phosphorus is one of the, the, the big components in helping plants and uh, the algae grow. So oligotrophic lakes are... Um, and, and, you know, oligo means low, um, you know, we have low nutrients, low plant growth. So if we don't have a lot of nutrients in lakes, there's just not the components there for plants to be able to grow and for algae to grow. And if you don't have the plants and algae growing, um, you don't have a lot of you know, that, that food base that allows insects and smaller fish to 
and zooplankton to be able to feed in those plants and, and algae. So there's not as much food there for some of the smaller fish, and there's not then that means there's not as much food for the bigger fish. So in general, if we don't have a lot of nutrients, a lot of plant growth, um, I don't want to say it's a sterile lake, but they, they're just as these, these lakes that are probably generally very clear, um, but they don't have a lot of complex structure in terms of the fish populations and, and the different fish species present. As you get um, more nutrients into a system, we move into more of a moderate state of nutrients and plant growth. And what we call, these are what we call mesotrophic lakes. And so these, these again are kind of a mid-level, um, more nutrients than a legotrophic lake. So there's a more complex plant and algae uh, populations, which then in turn supports more complex um, zooplankton, uh, insects, smaller fish, and the bigger fish. So it's, it's a little bit more of a complex system kind of in the middle in terms of the amount of nutrients and the growth. If we get towards the high end, we turn in, we, we see eutrophic lakes. So these are lakes with high nutrients, high plant growth, um, just a lot going on in these lakes in terms of the, the amount of, of um, nutrients that are in place for plants and algae to grow, which are feeding the, uh, the other pieces of that food web. And we can even go beyond eutrophic, and if we get super high levels of nutrients, and, and then which, which feeds super high levels of plant and algae growth, we could even move into a hyper eutrophic state. Lake Winnebago um, is generally um, generally falls within this eutrophic lake stage. So again, the way we measure um, the 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 way we were able to measure and kind of figure out where a lake falls in that continuum is we're looking at the water clarity. Um, the clearer the water generally means the, the lower the nutrients because you don't have the algae growing, the plants growing. Um, so we look at water clarity. Um, we look at the chlorophyll, which is a way to measure um, the algae and plants that are growing. And then we look at the amount of phosphorus, which again is the nutrient that really feeds that really is a, is a very much a important factor in feeding the growth of algae and plants. So within a lake, um, kind of going back to our, our series of um, charts that we were using when we were talking about the density of water, is you can see that in summer, with full, full stratification in, occurring in place, we don't have water mixing from top to bottom. And so uh, the epilimni on the upper part of that lake is not really mixing with the bottom part of this lake. And it's very warm temperatures. And this is where you see um, the, the plants growing. This is where you see the algae growing. So a lot of our productivity in a lake is occurring in this very upper portion of the lake, especially in summer. Um, and essentially, you've got this small band of, of the lake that is supporting a lot of the, the growth of, uh, that's occurring within a lake. So I'll wrap up with just a little bit of a um, discussion on the human influences. We've talked a little bit about the, the physical, biological, and chemical structures and how lakes are classified, but humans have a tremendous impact on lakes. And um, I just kind of finished up talking about the eutrophication of lakes, um, you know, how lakes may move or how, you know, how they may be classified as oligotrophic, mesotrophic, or eutrophic. And there's a process that can occur where as additional um, nutrients are added to a lake, you know, lakes that are uh, mesotrophic can move into be, to become eutrophic lakes. Oligotrophic lakes can move to become meso and ultimately, um, olig or ultimately eutrophic lakes. And so as we add more nutrients, we can kind of change how lakes function. Um, and we do that, we add nutrients through a combination of sources. One source is what we call point sources. These are uh, pipes that are discharging nutrients, especially if you think about a, a wastewater treatment facility that is treating our wastewater. It's discharging clean water into our lakes, into our uh, rivers, and some of that water can, so that water does um, include phosphorus, and phosphorus then is, is able to, to be used by the plants and the algae to drive productivity. We also have non-point sources of um, nutrients coming from our farm fields, coming from our lawns um, as fertilizers and manure and um, grass clippings are all uh, have nutrients in them, have phosphorus in them as those, um, those types of systems or as those types of um, practices or, or locations are providing nutrients into our rivers and streams and lakes 
um, they're adding into the uh, the nutrient. They can raise the nutrition level of those lakes, and we can move uh, lakes into the eutrophic status if we're not careful. Another big influence to our lake systems are, are these non-native invasive species. So these are uh, species of fish or plants or uh, the zooplankton or even algae that are not native to a given area, a given lake. And they may come from a different part of the world. And when they come here, they um, they have the ability, if, if they don't have, uh, if there aren't ways to control populations, they have ability to displace native species and cause problems within our lakes. So Lake Winnebago, for example, has uh, carp as a non-native invasive fish. Um, it has what we, there are two plants, uh, one called Eurasian water milfoil, one called curly leaf pondweed that are non-native invasive plants. Um, we have some, uh, some plants that are more associated with wetlands, such as uh, purple loosestrife that are invasive species, and these have the ability to greatly change that food dynamic and that, that food web dynamic that we see in some of our lakes. Uh, Lake Winnebago is very close to the Great Lakes, and so the Great Lakes are a great source of these non-native invasive species. So we are at a threat to, to the, the great number. There are approximately 180 non-native species in the Great Lakes right now, and many of these species um, you know, have the potential to reach Lake Winnebago and could cause problems with some of our native populations of, of fish or plants. The other uh, challenge with Lake Winnebago is that because it's a popular destination for fishing and for boating and for people coming to recreate, uh, we actually have the, and because we have some of these in non-native invasive species already in the lake, um, we could be a super spreader, meaning that we are kind of the source of moving these, these different invasive species to other lakes as someone, for example, if they were fishing on Lake Winnebago um, and, and picked up some plant fragments from uh, Eurasian water milfoil on their trailer and went to uh, a different lake, say in Washera County, they could introduce that invasive species to a different lake. Acidification is um, not quite as big of an issue as it, as it was maybe 20 years ago, um, but a lot of the uh, industrial uh, discharges with respect to smokestacks and air emissions um, were have or have an ability to um, to dramatically change the the pH of rainfall. And as rainfall is an important component in some lakes. Uh, some lakes could go through an acidification process, which could dramatically change the structures of um, those food webs that are occurring in lakes and, and dramatically change them. We also have the, uh, the ability to, um, the unfortunate ability to uh, pollute uh, our water bodies through toxics such as PCBs and mercury. Um, and as some of you are aware, the, the Fox River between uh, Lake Winnebago and Green Bay um, is the, the focus of a massive PCB cleanup effort right now where they are removing PCBs that had been introduced um, in the, the discharge of the wastewater coming out of a lot of our paper industry, uh, paper plants that, have, that are home or that are located along the Fox River. So I think at that point I'll end and hopefully this was just a, a good overview of lakes and um, I think you'll find that some of our uh, other presentations into the in the Dip into Lakes seminar series will go into a lot more detail, especially on the plants and on the fish aspect of our aquatic systems, and you'll be able to see the connections between those and how they connect to our landscape and to the lakes in general. So thank you very much.